Hello, and welcome to another episode of Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Our mission here at Higher Aim is to encourage hearts and empower lives. One of the ways we accomplish this mission is through our daily devotion email. Each devotion includes a passage of scripture and an insightful message that will encourage you and guide you in your study of God's word. These devotions are completely free and you can sign up today to begin receiving the daily email. Simply go to higheraim.org and click the button on the homepage that says sign up for the daily email devotions. You can also call our help center at 1-800-491-4400 as operators are standing by now to help you register for the email. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message from Dr. Kurt Dodd. Well, when we're trying to answer the question, what America needs today, the very best place is to go to the Word of God, someplace that is not in America from its historical grounding, but God's Word is applicable to every aspect of our lives. And nothing is more powerful for us to glean from than the Word of God. So trying to answer this question, what our country needs today, well, God's Word has an answer for that, as well as God's Word has an answer what you need today, what all of us need today. And so allow me to invite you to take your Bibles and go to the book of Acts. Now, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 provide for us a great platform by which we can truly answer this question about what our country needs today. But I want to first read to you uh, the sermon, if you will, out of Acts chapter 2 that Simon Peter preached, beginning in verse 38 and going through verse 37, uh, rather, verse 47. Uh, and this uh, sermon, if you will, would be re- re- received in, an, uh, in a, such an open way, a perfect time. Uh, in a perfect storm, with a perfect word. And God has that for you and for me today. Let's read together. Here's what the Scripture says, beginning in verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, this... passage that I've read to you is the birth, if you will, of the early church. And God would make the early church a mega church. The Bible tells us that 3,000 people were saved. Uh, Let me just tell you, they only counted men. That was not to discount women, but that's how they counted. Uh, And some suggest that there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 10, 15, maybe even 20,000 thousand people came to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of their life 
from this first sermon that Simon Peter preached there, coming out of the upper room and onto the, the streets of Jerusalem. God had gathered people from all over the world who would hear during this uh, festival of Pentecost the gospel. And it is wonderful to read today, but awesome for them to have experienced that back then. And we desperately need that same kind of awakening, uh, a spiritual shaking uh, in our country today like they experienced on the streets of Jerusalem then. And I need to tell you, that is possible. Now, you've heard me use this, this phrase or these two words, great awakening. Now, now, what exactly is that? Well, uh, it is a movement of God so powerful that it sweeps uh, uh, an area, uh, a geographical area, often uh, not only a city or a section of a city, but a county, a country, a nation, and often God would allow it to ripple onto another continent. It is a supernatural movement of God shaking uh, people to their very core and bringing them to a place of desiring a true, vibrant, life-giving relationship with God who created us. And that is exciting. And just like the the uh, citizenry of our day who were completely confused and headed in a wrong direction, so were the people of Simon Peter's day and the early church. And we desperately need to get our hands around how God wants to shake our country beginning with our lives. And just like the people in America today are confused and totally off base, thinking that their protest and uh, their organization can truly create revolutionary change, I need to tell you that the religion of the day during Simon Peter's day was just the same way. Israel was in need of a great awakening. And that great awakening came while Israel was under Roman authority. And regardless of what authority we may be under, God can do a great work in our lives. And yes, in our country. I do not believe it is too late. However, uh, during this Uh, time as we get ready to celebrate uh, our independence, our freedom as a country, I think it is important that we are careful that we do not celebrate our independence from God. In fact, the other uh, half of that statement leads us to realize that the greatest position that we could ever be in is that of dependence upon God. And therefore, I need to tell you, if we will ever see God move, we must get through this time in our country. And I believe that God is positioning us as a country for him to do a fresh work. But there are a couple of problems. Number one, it's this. Our country has forgotten the Lord. Uh, We have several generations that have already been raised up without prayer, prayer in schools in 1962. uh, There was a law of the land that prohibited prayer in schools. Now, it's been said that as long as there are tests, uh, you cannot stop prayer. Uh, And that's true from a humorous perspective. But 
something happened in the early 60s that began to say we are a secular society rather than a society that is sensitive to our values and our morality that is based and rooted in the Lord through the Scriptures. And that uh, set us free from our moorings from the Word of God, and it has been one step down after another since the, those moments. If you lived during the turbulent 60s, you saw what happened. And as we are living now into a new century that uh, is birthing more problems than any other time, we find ourselves in almost a, a social, spiritual earthquake zone. And it's all because our country has forgotten the Lord. And, and that's, that's critical for us to understand. I don't think there's one of us who uh, is listening today that would say, no, we, we know who the Lord is. I will tell you there are pockets of people who are committed to the Lord, but uh, by and large, we may use God's name, but to truly depend upon him and seek his face to resolve the issues that we are facing, that's another thing altogether. Uh, Previously, I shared with you that God brings judgment on a people. In the Scripture, Leviticus 18, let me just remind you quickly that there were several sins of the inhabitants of the promised land before Israel showed up that brought God's judgment to bear. In fact, there was a breaking point. And those four sins there in Leviticus 18 are important for us to recall. Number one, adultery. Number two, uh, child sacrifice. Number three, uh, the acceptability of homosexuality as normal. And then finally, bestiality. Because of the inhabitants of the land, uh, were uh, accepted, uh, accepting of those immoral values, God would raise up the children of Israel for a particular time, and God would bring judgment upon a pagan people. Now, many people will go, well, that was the Old Testament. And for us to extrapolate from the Old Testament and apply it to our lives today, well, that's just uh, out of the context of time. Oh, let me tell you, you need to think about that again. What is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. And that supersedes history the moral fabric of a people, the moral fabric of people in a nation either cries out for the protection of God or beckons the wrath of God. And though I believe that God wants to heal our land and he wants uh, to move in the population of our country and bring us back to the values of the Word of God and the value and the power of a relationship with Him, I believe that we are uh, positioned right on the edge of judgment, quite honestly. Uh, I've shared with you, and let me share with you again, the financial uh, upset uh, the turmoil that we have experienced in the financial markets, the, uh, the, the, it's been up and down and sideways. It, it's, it, is, it is hard to put a finger on, and it creates a sense of instability. Uh, the pandemic with the, the disease that uh, we have experienced, the, the viral outbreak that has affected not only our country, but the world uh, sh should be a warning sign to us. The racial tension, oh, what does that say to you? Something is not right. And you and I need to wake up to realize 
this truth. Our country has forgotten the Lord. And that's why I really believe that we are right on the edge of either the judgment of God or a great awakening. What our country needs is a great awakening. That's what I'm praying for. But there's another problem, too. Our country wants to forget our history. Uh, what is happening in our country today is absurd. And let me just be real clear with you and tell you, it is nuts. It's crazy. It doesn't make sense to think that uh, by removing statues, renaming buildings and schools, can somehow or another fix the wrongs of the past is ridiculous. And that's what is happening. Do we actually think that by pulling down Confederate statues of uh, venerated generals that somehow or another that's going to right the wrongs of the past or put us on uh, a right path? Do you think actually that renaming uh, uh, a, a, a building uh, in somebody else's name who possibly in the days to come will uncover something in their past that was a little unsavory, will fix our country. In fact, I read uh, the other day that there is one of our states that is thinking about changing its name because of, of, of the connection of their name to uh, the concept of slavery in the past. Do you actually think changing the name of anything will change the inside of something. I don't think so. And what is happening here is a setup. Uh, one philosopher from Harvard once said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Think about that for a second. What we need is a fresh history lesson. I, I saw uh, one of the uh, protests that pulled down uh, the uh, statue of Ulysses Grant, one of the uh, 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 generals who fought in the Union Army and who would later become president of our country. They pulled it down because he fought in the Civil War thinking somehow or another that'll change things, when in reality, if there was anybody who fought for the uh, rights of black Americans, it was him. And he did some unprecedented things to, to move forward uh, the, the racial uh, barriers by bringing them down. Uh, it seems like there are movements today that don't even know history. Uh, that tells me that our country wants to forget uh, our history. This land of ours, our government, has deep biblical roots. Do you realize that many of the things that God has done in the past have been as uh, a result of his movement in his people, and then when he moves in the lives of his people, then the governments change. And many of us, we think that uh, governments change all by themselves. But when we forget him and we forget our past, we lose our way to finding lasting change. Today, people are not even interested in due process they think that protest uh, will make all the difference in the world. And what has happened is that anarchy has replaced the due process out of frustration. And here's the deal. The mob doesn't bring anything but greater frustration and conflict. And they have a fickle mind. They change left and right, just like the mob that would be brought together that would lead to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The mob does not have the ability to think straight. 
much less think spiritually. And I will tell you that um, we are in deep weeds in this country, and I believe we are in deep mud too. You know why? Because the church has some serious problems today. And I want to tell you what I think they are. Number one, we have forgotten the Lord ourselves and have replaced him with our activity for him. I want you to think about that for a moment. There are a lot of people who want to do the activity of religion rather than actually knowing the Lord intimately. They'd rather talk about him than talk to him. That They would rather do the things to serve him rather than to bow before him. In fact, I will tell you that it's like this. Um, we're focused on the product of spiritual awakenings rather than focused on the producer of spiritual awakenings. Do you realize that, that uh, worship, singing, uh, service, uh, and even great prayer uh, and ministry to uh, bless other people's lives are the result of spiritual awakenings. Uh, they don't produce spiritual awakenings, but they are the result of spiritual awakenings. Uh, and sometimes we, we just put the emphasis, as I like to say, on the wrong syllable. And when we focus on uh, the product of a spiritual awakening rather than the producer of spiritual awakening, we are off base. And I think that that's what has happened in our country. Uh, for churches, we're, we're more concerned about program and organization and architecture and schedules. What's up with that? We need to be focused on bowing before the Lord himself. I will tell you another thing. We have forgotten, I'm speaking of the church, we have forgotten our spiritual history of how God has moved in the past, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, much less in our nation's history. Uh, and you, you know wh what I feel about this. Uh, I've s shared it with you before. One of the reasons why that is happening is that we have men in the pulpits all across our country who have not studied uh, biblical history nor church history. Uh, they, they are focused on contemporary history and what's hot now. And they often lead their people to do things that are good, but not right. They're out of order. Uh, and let me just tell you this, uh, and I know this may offend some of you, but I, I'm, uh, I guess, an equal opportunity offender here. I've watched uh, Christians, well-meaning Christians, bow before uh, a group of, of, of black Christians and apologize and ask their forgiveness. Now, that's something well and good to ask someone's forgiveness, but you do not bow your knee to another man of flesh. And the forgiveness that needs to be asked of is to God first. And until we get right with God, we will never get right with each other. And it's out of order, it is out of balance. And though it may feel right and give us a sense of, well, at least we did something, it does not produce change. We've already seen that happen before. And it does not produce change. Only change in the heart between a man and his maker will create the kind of response between man and man that we really desire. And our church has forgotten our spiritual history. This is a time we need to be looking back into the Word of God and studying what God has done both in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well as history. And many are, are totally uh, blind as to what God has actually done. I will also tell you 
that we are in deep weeds and deep mud because we have ignored the path for change and are more active in trying to serve, trying to, to sing. And as wonderful as serving and singing are, they don't bring awakenings or revivals. Effective studying, effective serving, effective worship, again, let me say, they are the results of great awakenings. They are the fire after the spark. But here's the problem. Our wood is wet. Our wood is wet. The church's wood today is wet, and it's not on fire. And we can dance around the campfire that is not lit, or we can come back to the place to where we can experience a great awakening. It's time to have a history lesson. And I pray that, that God will do a work in your life. And what I've shared with you in our, our time together this morning is honestly just introduction. I, I've got much more to share with you in the days to come. But can I tell you this? Unless God's children get right with him first, we will never see our country get right with each other. God wants his children who have been bought by the blood of Jesus to come to a fresh moment in their life where they spiritually acknowledge their self-absorbed life and self-absorbed focus and self-described uh, organization and throw themselves helplessly, hopelessly upon the mercy of God. Let me ask you a question. Are you satisfied with your spiritual life right now? Are you satisfied with what God is doing in your life? Or do you feel helpless and hopeless, praying for change, but seeing no change both uh, in our country as well as in your own family and in your own life? Is there a heart ache for God to do something fresh and new in your life? I pray that there is because the only way our country will experience what God wants our country to experience is for us personally to experience what God wants us to experience. Years ago when I was in seminary, I was taking a course uh, called Missionary Preparation, and there was uh, an elderly, retired missionary who still had fire in her bones. She had seen God do amazing, uh, an amazing work in China. Uh, during her time there, she saw God deliver people, heal people, uh, saw him shake an entire nation and bring people to saving faith in Christ. She saw not only the miraculous, she saw the supernatural change that only God could give. Her name was Bertha Smith, and I'll never forget when I saw her first. Her hair was in a bun. She had uh, 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 small little glasses and her face had the deep crevices of age, but her voice spoke volumes. And I'll never forget what she said. As she walked in front of our class, she uh, drew on the board sin, S-I-N. And she asked a very important question, boys, are your sins confessed up to date? I'll never forget that. Boys, 
Are your sins confessed up to date? My first thought was, Lord, I'm here. I'm studying your word. I'm preparing myself for ministry. But her question was probing. Are your sins confessed up to date? Wanting God to do something through your life will not happen until God does something in your life. And you know what I did? I found a place where I could get along with God. And as a believer, as a child of God who was preparing for ministry, I said, Lord, I really want to make sure that there is nothing between me and you, that there's nothing that I'm harboring in my life. And I'm praying right now that you would reveal to me whatever needs to go. Is there any attitude, any action? Uh, anything I've said, anything I've done that is dishonoring to you and that has broken your heart. I want my life to be clean. I want my life to be a conduit for your spirit. And as I begin to pray, I just waited on the Lord. And he began to show me sin after sin after sin because I had prayed that little prayer that many of us pray, oh God, forgive us of all of our sins. And many of us, we don't realize that God forgives us our sins as specifically as they are committed. And he wants us to repent of our sin just individually as they are committed. So let me ask you a question. Are your sins confessed up to date? You know, before I share with you the rest of the message, you and I need to make sure our sins are confessed up to date. I want to invite you to do business with God right now. Don't wait another moment. Don't wait for another service. You may not have another moment. There may not be another service. This is your chance. This is your moment to get right with God. Would you? Would you start right now? Just bow your head and say, Lord, would you show me any sin that is separating me from you? And show me how to repent, how long to repent, so that I can see and experience you working and moving in my life so that our country will see you move again. In Jesus' name, amen. I got so much to share with you. I wished I could do it all at once, but I can't to do what I need to do. But I pray that you will hear what I have shared with you and take it to heart. And I pray if indeed you have never given your life to Christ, you'd call us right now on that 800 number. There's someone who's standing by who wants to talk to you to show you how to give your life to Christ. Or maybe there's a need in your life right now. You just need somebody to pray with you. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody about processing what what God is impressing upon you right now. I pray you'd call us, would you? Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.